Welcome. Let's take a look now at some of the charts uh, with our regular guest Serge Berger from the SteadyTrader.com. Before we get to Serge, just very quickly talk a little bit about some of the fundamentals because that is giving a little bit of a steer to the markets in the context of where we are. As at the time of recording, we've just been hearing from some of the big U.S. bankers, Jamie Dimon in particular from J.P. Morgan, who's uh, suggesting that in 2023 we could well get a recession. There have been some economists suggesting that the U.S. economy might actually skirt this. We already know from anecdotal evidence here on this side of the Atlantic that the U.K. economy is already in recession and many are pricing in recessions across the European Union, the major countries there as well, the, the, the real motors of uh, any growth across Europe likely to go into contraction in 2023. Let's take a look now as we go into the back end of the year from a technical perspective with Serge Berger from the SeddyTrader.com and say uh, good day to you Serge. It's great to be able to catch up with you again for our last uh, uh, look at the markets uh, in 2022. With this backdrop, what should we be doing as traders? Hey Jeremy, yeah, good to be on. I mean, look, I, I think at this point, and we're at a point where it's going to be tricky to either decide to, to, to thread the needle for the rest of the year, and there's a couple of points here that we need to be aware of, a couple of data points, or do we start positioning basically for the new year? So from a data point perspective, I need the economic data point, both sides of the pond, but I think we probably all agree that central banking wise, it's gonna be important to see what the Fed says. So we have a CPI report next Tuesday, the 13th of December, and then the 14th, we have the FOMC meeting, so the Fed meeting. So those will, that could be a pretty important toggle. Um, I don't really know, honestly, what to do. I trend I, in, in terms of through that, I, I tend to always go into cash and on swing trading positions through important data points like that. I call them known unknowns. We know the date, we know the announcement, we don't know what the outcome is or how the market reacts. Um, so, you know, I think that's a toggle point for them for the rest of the year. But I do think as we get into January, which historically does have a pretty good tendency to be to give us some pretty wild swings, I think we're going to start to see a pretty um, a pretty violent move back down to the downside through a multi-month lens there. And I brought along a chart here of which is essentially the NASDAQ 100 um, as represented by the triple Q ETF. And what we have at the top is the price chart. And the bottom is the VIX, which I think everyone knows uh, as the implied volatility or the implied volatility index of the S&P 500. And what you can focus on here is just those four bubbles all the way at the bottom. Those four bubbles represent each time this year when the VIX was below 20 or around there. Each four of those data points, if you match them up with, with the bubbles on top, uh, you can see marked a lower high in the S&P 500, uh, excuse me, in the NASDAQ 100. Um, the question, of course, is, is it going to happen again now? We had the VIX index touch 19 the other day. Um, and since then, the NASDAQ's pulled, pulled back a little bit. But I think really we have to look at this through a multi-month lens. And you can see usually we saw a multi-month drop when we had the VIX below 20. So that is really what I'm focusing on. Um, and I do think, quite frankly, we're going to revisit those lows. Now, S&P wise, which I know everyone likes to look at the S&P, understandably so, it's more or less the same story. I still think we, we at some point in the first or second quarter next year see something between um, maybe in the low end 2,900 to maybe on the higher end 3,500, 600. I'm gonna say about 3,200 is my base case um, because 3,200 does kind of match up with this level here. Um, and there's many other reasons for it, by the way, including fundamental reasons and so on and so forth, but it does match up pretty optically optically quite nicely with the, the pre-COVID highs and then consolidation and then maybe a move to the downside. And that would also get the S&P to be down um, about 30%, which I think is kind of in the ballpark. Yes, yeah, so, so far as the, um, the the indices are concerned, then um, it's really all about what's likely to happen and develop into the new year. How does the S&P re relate to what's going on in the, the, the NASDAQ? I'm a denominator. There's probably going to be some of the, 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 the last as I call them, the last battles to be fought in the bull market, which is usually, so, you know, some some of the the the, the darlings of, of the previous bull market, and they don't get any bigger than Tesla and Apple. That's probably the common denominator. Otherwise, beyond individual names, and, and we can talk about that as well. Really, you're just looking at people de-risking. The individual investor has not capitulated yet. Um, I think institutionals have de-risked but not capitulated. So all of that, it's, it ends up being an exercise of positioning or 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 getting rid of positioning, basically. So, so the stocks you mentioned, Tesla and Apple, particularly the other big tech stocks, have already taken a, a fair knock. Are you suggesting that the uh, downside is yet to fully develop uh, for these big uh, for, techs? 
Yeah, I mean, if we look at Tesla here, I brought this one along. Let's first look at quickly the, the, the optics here, which is the chart, and then we can talk about what some of the other actual drivers are. I mean, from an, from optically speaking, you can see what I think a lot of people know is a head and shoulders pattern. We can call this whatever we want. And ultimately, I think this stock is going to be somewhere between 140 and 100. Um, 100 being the very low end of, of that of, of the possible range I could see, maybe 150 in the high end. So 140 to being sort of base case maybe in 100 being on the very low end. Now, this is not really a call against what Tesla does or, or even the, the founder. It has nothing to do with that. It's really a lot, of, a lot of his positioning to me. And I do think, you know, you, we can do sentiment readings on that. And, and when we do that, we still see a lot of people just have not sold any Tesla. They remain bullish. They're way over overextended in terms of their allocations. So I think as we start to see another leg lower, there's probably going to be more pressure on these last battles that need to be fought in Tesla. If you look at Apple, it's more or less the same story. It's maybe a bit more robust and less volatile in many ways, but here too, you probably need to see Apple retest, you know, 130. I'm um, quite frankly, have no problem seeing the stock go back down to 110s. So these are the two battles I think that are that are still being fought by the bulls, and and they probably will give up those battles as we have another meaningful leg lower. How does all this um, re relate to what's happening here on this side of the Atlantic? As traders, we tend to go for the German DAX, which has really moved quite uh, violently compared to other indices uh, on this side of the Atlantic. And I think actually from the lows that we've had back in October, we've seen a bull market develop again. We're up around about 23%. Yes, there's been some consolidation recently. And as of the time of recording, we've got a little bit of a weaker picture developing uh, in this trading week. Um, but we have seen that big wide, wide swing up. What about the DAX as a, as a trading opportunity? It, it's remarkable. I mean, the, the DAX is a volatile index. I think, you know, sometimes we forget that. We tend to think of it as kind of like this, you know, German industrial ETF, but it is very volatile. Um, what I can tell you here is we're at a pretty important retracement level. Um, you know, I mean, just to put that rally into context that you mentioned there, uh, Jeremy, I mean, that's a 23% move in an index. <laughs> you know, I think the NASDAQ only moved like 18, 19. That's, it's, these, are, these are big moves. Now, from a through the lens of something called Fibonacci analysis, um, the retracement level we've come to now, so basically if you measure the, the all-time highs in December, so almost exactly one year ago, down to the lows we had in September, we've now retraced exactly 61.8%. So from, from that perspective, and, and of course economic gravity being the ultimate order, the ultimate what's most important here, I do think the DAX is probably topped out and it's gonna go back into that 12,000 know, know, range over the course of the next, couple of months or so and quite can go much lower. I mean, you can, I, I have no problem, you know, I no doubt that the DAX could go towards, you know, that 11,000, quite frankly, 10,000 wouldn't shock me either, but it, this takes time. This is not a call for tomorrow or next week. This is really kind of first, second quarter, 2023 timeframe. Okay, let's, uh, let's move out and uh, take a look at some of the other um, moves in the market at the moment. And uh, referencing, I guess, part of what I was talking about at the top about this threat of recession, we seem to be seem to be seeking out some sort of haven trade. And that, of course, is the US dollar. Uh, when we last spoke um, a month ago, we were talking about the weakness, the downside to come. In fact, we do, did have some downside in the dollar. Is this a time to get back in on the long side? I think so. And and actually, you're exactly right. I mean, last time we spoke, we were basically looking at the dollar index and talk, talking about a topping process, um, which has happened. Um, we spoke early, some, some around early November, and, and we talked about how that could be positive for equities and ultimately positive for bonds. And, and that has been true. Now, I do think it's getting very oversold again. And um, if, you, if you look at the dollar index, you know, through you can look at a thousand different ways, but I kind of like to keep it simple. Um, and that 200 day moving average is, it's kind of been pierced, but we're also seeing extreme oversold levels from a very near term perspective. Uh, and again, if we think about what that means, you know, for the, for the rest of the market, if we do think equities are going to go down, go down, a lot of that's probably going to mean, you know, some, some net inflow into treasuries again. Um, you know, the treasury, us treasury market, the bond market has a sort of a very, um, envious position that it's in, which is when things get bad, people tend to buy the U.S. debt that cannot be said for like for example the EU like when things get bad people don't buy European bonds it's 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 a bit perverse in that sense but that's kind of what happens so I do think 
dollar higher from here, and quite frankly, wouldn't be surprised if we at least retest those highs um, through that first, second quarter period of next year, which is going to coincide again with the inverse in equities, equities going lower. Serge, we've almost um, hit our time. I just want to quickly catch up on what's happening with the price of gold. I've just noticed actually a, a headline just passing uh, China gold reserves rising for the first time in over three years. Now, this would seem to indicate to me that there's a, an appetite uh, for getting back into the gold market. We haven't really seen any sort of upside rally recently. Um, are things about to change or is it just a question of uh, standing on the sidelines and waiting for some sort of a breakout in gold before you're prepared to take a position? Yeah, well, keep in mind, I mean, it's a great headline to know. Of course, that reflects what's happened. It doesn't reflect what's going to happen in the future, right? So they have now up their reserves, and 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 I I do think they're all you know this is happening globally. This except maybe I think Turkey's been a seller of gold for a year, a few years now. But I think other than other than that, this should be a net positive. Um, ultimately, what tends to drive gold is is, is the rate of inflation, um, and and then how that relates to the rate of growth in the economy. I think the the sooner we get back into into bond yields that are uh, that are negative real interest rates, I should say. Um, the sooner that'll be positive for gold. And I do th- I do think the the move we've seen for the past few weeks in gold is a good start. It's not trending yet. You can see the long-term chart remains basically this in the consolidation phase, but I do think it's a good start and certainly, certainly something I want to watch very closely heading into 2023. Okay, that's it. Nice place to stop. Serge, thanks indeed for your uh, contribution. Uh, and indeed, over the year, uh, have a uh, great end to 2022. And we look forward to speaking to you again next year. Thanks indeed for your time. That's Serge Berger from thestudytrader.com with us uh, as we look at the markets in this early part of December 2022.